When it comes to talk about Bitcoin, there are names impossible not to mention, considering their knowledge and their contributions to this phenomenon. One of them is Andreas Antonopoulos. We had the opportunity to talk with Andreas about Bitcoin beyond its technological and economical perspective, but instead about freedom, democracy, constitutional law, and rule of law. Hi, Andrea. Yasu. <laughs> Yasu, hello. Uh, very good to see you. Yes. See, you're a technologist, and a lot of people think Bitcoin and blockchain mostly from the technological part of view and also economic point of view. On the other mm -hmm. side, my preparation and my academic studies are dealing with law and more specifically constitutional law. And constitutional mm -hmm. law is about freedoms and restraining power. I would mm -hmm. like to hear about your opinions on restraining powers and what Bitcoin and what blockchain has to do with it. Um, yes, I mean, I, I also have a very political perspective on uh, Bitcoin and related technologies, and I also see them as relevant to the application of law and more specifically to uh, personal freedoms, um, civil liberties, uh, civil rights, and all of the privacy-related um, requirements that are in most constitutions. So um, what, what Bitcoin and the way this technology is related to these things is that it gives power to individuals to assert their rights through technology. And um, that power is less easily infringed uh, by governments that do not respect um, their own constitutions. So uh, it's, it's one thing to depend on the constraint of power that is part of a legal doctrine. Um, it is another thing to use technology to assert the power um, and the rights that you have um, and to control the power of government through technology. And I think it's a, it's a more effective way of asserting those rights. See, at this moment, we're having this special situation of, you know, being locked down for the coronavirus and stuff. I mm -hmm. will see that technology plays a very important role in this. And the, but the problem on the other side is we could have more police states Mm -hmm. How could this, you know, the technologies and decentralized technologies could help to avoid those police, police states? Um, well, you know, I, I don't think that uh, this particular technology helps us um, in this way um, because the, 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 the issue here is mostly um, played out in the physical world. So unlike the domain of money or trust or communication, which are intangibles that happen um, online and have to do with digital life, um, restrictions on movement are a physical thing. And in, in that case, the ability of uh, governments to impose physical restrictions on people is greatly um, enhanced and it's very difficult for people to fight back. However, um, I would say that, you know, there's, there's also been kind of um, uh, an, an effort to portray this uh, in many cases as an effort by government to control the movement of people um, versus the effort by government to surveil the movements of people. I think those two are two very different things. So for example, if you look at the studies that have happened in the United States, um, what we found is that um, the restriction of movement of people started before the government orders. Basically people voluntarily um, decided to stay at home because they felt it was not safe to go out, which is a rational act uh, and a voluntary act. 
um, the lockdowns uh, really mostly had an effect on uh, uh, people who were not acting rationally and were endangering others with their behavior. Um, and they complained a lot, uh, rightly so, in fact. But um, even after the lockdowns ended in many states in the US, uh, we didn't see a huge rush of movement. Um, the majority of people, at least here, uh, continued to voluntarily isolate. Um, so the act of isolation was separate from the orders imposed by government. Uh, neither locking down nor unlocking really had much difference in the behavior of, of people other than a very small minority. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a very different issue than the broader issue of um, the excuse that governments are using to impose surveillance on location and movement um, through mobile devices, which is a very dangerous phenomenon, of course, and which has been wholly embraced, uh, both by uh, very obviously authoritarian governments, like uh, the governments in China, for example, um, and also um, supposedly democracies uh, with authoritarian tendencies, as we've seen, for example, in India. Um, but uh, for the most part, that's, uh, we see that's a lot less uh, in some of the more open governments out there. I see. See, um, with me, with two other professors, we have this uh, think tank. And I have this question from Robinson Rivas. He's the director of the Computer Science University in La Universidad Central de Venezuela. And I'm going to read it to you. And we take it as, a, you know, foundations to talk about something. Mm -hmm. He asks, social networking grew up as a new way of expression where people empowered themselves around the world in new, fresh, and free ways. But behind mm -hmm. mainstream social media, there are still big companies, such mm -hmm. it is Facebook, Google, but also governments with specific interests. Mm -hmm. Do you believe blockchain-driven economy and applications can lead to a new way of expression and freedom for people, kind of new social media technologies, this time without the shadow of corporate interests? Um, we already have that capability. So um, it is possible to re-decentralize the web, as I call it, and um, to implement applications that offer people um, social interaction without centralized control by uh, very large corporations. But, um, you know, the, the capability exists on the internet today. There are great applications that people can use. There, are, there is the ability to uh, build websites and communicate in a variety of ways. And it's actually relatively difficult for both government and corporations to censor uh, what happens on uh, on the internet. The, the biggest problem, however, is, is, is not uh, controls over internet communication or even um, the power of corporations. It's uh, individual choice. Uh, you see, the problem is that for most people, convenience um, is sought after and comfort is sought after much more strongly than liberty. Um, when, uh, when they perceive themselves to be more or less free uh, and until they're really in the grip of an authoritarian situation, um, they will consistently relinquish their power in order for uh, comfort and perceived safety. We all do that. It's, it's part of human nature, right? And so, um, you know, people don't have to use Facebook. They choose to use Facebook. There are other platforms available. Um, there are ways to use the internet without these uh, giant corporations. And yet people not only do use these, uh, but they use them instead of all of the other things that are out there. Um, and um, they, they do so because of convenience. So that, that is the, the big danger. Uh, it's that, uh, in my opinion, people disempower themselves even when there is better and more free technology out there because of comfort and convenience. And of course, uh, both corporations and governments ruthlessly exploit that human tendency in order to exert control. So 
we already have the technology for decentralized uh, for the decentralized internet. We had it since the beginning of the internet. We already have the decentralized web. Um, we already have the ability to, to build decentralized applications. What blockchain technology gives us is a way to achieve better funding of that um, so that we can build out better infrastructure, which is a big advantage. Um, so for example, if you're a creator today and you uh, need to make a living through your work, then you have to go to platforms that support advertising because that's the only way to, or that's one of the few and easy ways to, to raise money. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at with blockchain technologies and especially Bitcoin is the ability to um, pay creators for their work directly to cut out the intermediaries um, and to enable new models for expression, but also for an economy around creative work uh, that is based on a direct contact between a creator and their audience without intermediaries. Interesting. See, talking about Bitcoin and blockchain, it is, you know, also leads us to talk about smart contracts. And I have mm -hmm. this question from Ruben Guia, who's also a professor, and he asks, do you think smart contracts can help to create a decentralized society with a direct democracy and less corruption? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, that's the simple answer. Yes, I absolutely do think that um, we can replace traditional institutions, uh, hierarchical institutions of trust and governance that we have today, um, which are not scaling, which are not representative, and which are easily corrupted with better institutions based on network uh, protocols, based on smart contracts, uh, which scale better, which reflect representative governance better, and which are more difficult to corrupt. Absolutely. I saw on your books that you refer directly from to the situation we're living here in Venezuela. So that mm -hmm. means that you are very aware of how the money it doesn't exist, you know, the Bolivar, it, it doesn't exist has a money, as it should be money. Mm -hmm. And now we see and we have this Petro thing that I also, you know, call it Petro populism because it is mm -hmm. being used for some means and some, and some you know, ideas that they don't match the idea of cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. like you know, neutrality and stuff. What is your perspective about the famous or infamous Petro? I mean, the Petro is a scam. Totally it's as scam. simple as that. It's, 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 um, it's a desperate attempt Can we um, by a failing a period. It's a scam period. I mean, but it's a desperate attempt by a failing dictator to put lipstick on a pig and make it fly. Um, and it's not going to fly because uh, the, the problem with the Petro, the primary problem with the Petro um, is, is, is not the, the model of monetization of petrol resources or any of that. The problem with the Petro is that it is centrally controlled um, and therefore its trust depends on trusting the central institution. And that central institution is a failed government that has completely lost everybody's trust. And so therefore um, it can't work. That's the real simple answer. The Petro could have worked if it was based on uh, a mechanism that did not require you to trust uh, the Maduro government. But since that's the mechanism of trust in the Petro and that government has no trust, not domestically, not internationally, um, the end result is that you have a scam. We are in the same direction. From the day one, we saw it that way. Even, mm -hmm. not, even all, all, not only from the political perspective, but only, only, also technologically. We'll yes. see in the first attempt, they tried to do it on Ethereum. They did try to do it on NAM. They invented something else, but well, that's a scam period. Let's move to another, another issue. Money understood has free movement you know, of services and products, and this is a mean to do it. I consider it a, a human right, a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. So cryptocurrency, it will be considered then and to enhance, enhance that right. I right. would like to talk a little bit about the idea of property has a fundamental right 
and how mm -hmm. Bitcoin enhances this property has a fundamental right that it is. Well, if you think about it, and I, I'd like to broaden it a bit, uh, and I've talked about this in uh, a couple of my talks, what uh, an open decentralized blockchain does is it delivers a mechanism by which you can, uh, uh, you can use um, trust as a network service. So uh, basically you can build applications of trust on top of a network that is not controlled by anyone so that that trust can't be broken. Now, if you think about trust, um, trust is a means and it's a means to achieving something else and that something else is justice. Um, so from my perspective, these networks are mechanisms by which individuals can uh, essentially secure justice for themselves as a service that is delivered by a network instead of a state. So the primary purpose of a state, of a system of law, is to deliver justice. And um, when that system of law or the system of the state no longer delivers justice, no longer secures the rights, uh, the property, um, the safety, etc., of its people, then it is no longer delivering the service of justice. If you think of a, a state as a service provider, um, as an institution that delivers justice, uh, we see that that's failing in, in many countries around the world. And one of the thing I see is that decentralized blockchains offer justice as a network service, uh, justice over IP, if you like. And so uh, the basic idea here is that you can use these platforms to establish and secure property rights, to establish and secure the right uh, of expression and speech, the right to freedom of conscience, the right of freedom of association, the right of uh, uh, freedom of association in a commercial respect um, or in a professional respect, um, and all of the property rights that come with that. Uh, now, obviously, these network-based justice systems can't enforce uh, rights that are fundamental to your own physical um, bodily integrity because uh, that exists in geographic uh, space, in real space, and, and governments can violate that. But if you're operating within such a network with other people who are agreeing uh, to the rules of that network, then within that context, your property rights can be secured, as can many other rights. Uh, and so that's a very interesting model, I think, for delivering the service of justice without the uh, need for uh, the state to act as a guarantor of those rights. You're mentioning two main ideas and two great ideas, trust and justice. Mm -hmm. Any society that is lack of legal certainty, in Spanish we call it seguridad jurídica, mm -hmm. is not going to move forward at all. Yes. Do you think that adopting and really adopting blockchain and really adopting, not like Venezuela did with the Petro thing, could enhance this idea of legal certainty? And do you have any experience of seeing any society genuinely, genuinely adopting these technologies? Yes, um, I, I have seen a society genuinely adopting these technologies. That society is called the global internet. Uh, and it, it's ironic because a lot of the time we start thinking about what would happen if a nation state adopts these technologies. Um, and a nation state isn't a society. A nation state is uh, an institution uh, created by a society in order to enforce these rights. And, and blockchains are, are non-institutions created by people uh, also to enforce these rights. So the idea of um, one institution of trust adopting a competing institution of trust to deliver these services doesn't make sense. Governments won't adopt blockchain to deliver uh, institutions of trust because in the process of adopting these blockchains, they change the governance model. They change the governance model to put their institution at the center of governance, which then completely obliviates uh, all purpose of having this alternative governance model. And so it's not states or governments or countries that will adopt these technologies. It's individuals that will adopt these technologies. And through their adoption of these technologies, when you adopt one of these technologies, you are entering into a social contract with the other people who are participating in this technology. 
um, and you're placing your own wealth and property on this technology, uh, thereby accepting that the rules that govern your property will govern everybody else's property, and that gives you uh, the power through participation. Uh, so it doesn't matter what governments do. They don't have to endorse, adopt, um, acknowledge, uh, and, and at the same time, it doesn't matter if they fight, resist, ban, uh, demolish, uh, denounce. None of that matters. Uh, all of that is completely irrelevant. What matters is how many of these 7.5 billion people on this planet choose independently to use these technologies to establish their own property rights. Uh, and when they do that, that system is completely parallel to the existing system of uh, nation state uh, rights. And it exists on the one uh, global society of the internet, which of course is fragmented and has all kinds of its own problems, um, but uh, it, it does exist. Well, you're mentioning things interesting also because of the justice, it is a service rendered by the states. So mm -hmm. this could change definitely the idea that we have about the states. So this is more the, uh, a philosophical, political question. So do well, you I mean, if you, if you think about it, the, the idea that justice is a, is a service delivered by the state is relatively modern um, and didn't exist really until, I don't know, the 15th century. Um, before that, it was very clearly that uh, justice was a service delivered by the church uh, that was the state um, and, and uh, sometimes was the super state. So the transition from the church being the source of justice to uh, a secular state being a source of justice, a relatively recent transition, and it's quite all right to consider an additional transition um, beyond the state. The nation state hasn't existed forever, and there's no reason why it will continue to exist forever, other than um, just the force of tradition. See, si. perfect. See, si. I heard that, I, I read that you've been visiting Argentina, so you more or less know the situation in Latin America, and I heard that you speak a little bit of Spanish, so it will be good if you can give us some ideas of the perspective and the futures and the challenges of our cultures and our societies towards Bitcoin and decentralized uh, systems like uh, blockchain. Well, I, yes, I've, I've spent um, a lot of time actually in uh, Argentina. I've lived there um, for months at a time um, and I visited uh, I don't know, seven or eight times now in the past um, decade. I, and I've also visited many other countries throughout Latin America as well as Central America and the Caribbean. Um, so the, the, whole, um, the whole region um, suffers from dysfunctional state institutions, um, not through some natural process of erosion, of course. Uh, I, I think it's important to note that th the reason um, all of South America and Central America suffer from dysfunctional institutions is because those institutions are institutions that were first imposed by colonialism and then repeatedly destroyed by imperialism and manufactured dictatorships um, from the United States and other countries. So uh, you, you can't separate the two. None of these institutions are native. The institutions that were, were native, uh, the institutions of states of you know, the Aztec, the Mayas, the Incas, uh, and the other Mesoamerican people were deliberately destroyed. Um, so it, it's not surprising that these um, imported state institutions haven't done very well um, and continue to do poorly under constant interference. Uh, and it's created a very dysfunctional situation for the people who suffer unnecessarily through no fault of their own. So um, from that perspective, uh, one of the things that's clear to me when I visit, um, especially Latin America, is that we need new solutions. And it's really interesting, and I, I've said this many times before, when I go to uh, various countries in North America or Western Europe, um, the main question I get is, why do we need Bitcoin? And, and when I go to Latin America, nobody asks why we need Bitcoin. Everybody already knows why we need Bitcoin. 
I, I don't need to say, what if the banks fail? Uh, I don't need to say, what if the banks confiscate your money? I don't need to say, what happens if your government becomes a corrupt dictatorship? Um, because all of these things have happened. So uh, it's very clear why we need Bitcoin, uh, why we need these alternative institutions of money, alternative institutions of trust, alternative mechanisms of governance. Um, the real question that comes up again and again is how, when, how quickly, um, what do I do as an individual? Uh, and, and that's where the most of the discussions are, are happening. So decentralization is the key. Absolutely. That, that, that is the whole point of everything that we're doing in this space. See, in order more than closing the, the, the idea, the main idea, do you think that Bitcoin is only the tip of the iceberg of a new revolution, a new human revolution, where civil society has to be the, the star, the starting role in here? The protagonism is the civil society. Yes, but I, I wouldn't identify Bitcoin as um, kind of the tip of the iceberg or the, if you like, the tip of the spear. Um, it's, it's more the internet that is the tip um, of this spear. And, and uh, Bitcoin comes later um, and, and only makes that, um, makes that a bigger impact. Uh, and after Bitcoin follow many, many other things that have been built based on the same mentality. The first decentralized um, invention, I mean, there have been many decentralized inventions in humanity, but the first decentralized invention in digital communications was the internet. Um, Bitcoin is simply a child of the internet that takes one narrow part of the internet, which is trust, and turns it into an internet protocol uh, so that it can follow communications um, and social interactions, which have already been uh, made possible on a global and decentralized basis by the internet. So um, I, I think it's important to recognize that Bitcoin is a product of the internet. It's part of the internet. It's the next phase uh, in the evolution uh, after social networking and um, political communications and, and, and basic expression and um, the reimagining of, of news and media and uh, political association, all of that happened before Bitcoin. And now with Bitcoin, we're getting the same thing with trust money. And then after Bitcoin with other platforms like Ethereum building governance and smart contracts. And all of these are successive waves of the internet transforming us very, very quickly, faster than most people are comfortable with into a global interconnected society. Um, and that will have a, a completely transformational and lasting impact uh, on the world. You mentioned it, you've been visiting a couple times Argentina. It's a great place, <laughs> good meat and good wine. And like, yes, fantastic. And, and, and not just Argentina. I mean, I've spent years visiting uh, Mexico. I've been to Chile and Peru. I've been to um, um, half of Central America, um, probably more. Uh, it's, it's actually a pity that I, I haven't been able to visit uh, Venezuela, um, and I don't think I will be able to visit. Uh, not now, at not now. At the moment. At the moment, not at the not moment. At the but, moment. but I hope one day I will. Be, yeah, I, I hope one day I'll be able to visit a free Venezuela where I'll be able to um, contribute something and, and um, help people there. Uh, but it's. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I have uh, quite a few friends and colleagues uh, from Venezuela, and I've hired uh, quite a few people from Venezuela for various uh, bits of work in my business. Um, and, you know, I've, I've gotten to know how wonderful the people of Venezuela are, um, together with the rest of Latin America. I really love um, the lifestyle. Ironically, um, as someone who comes from Greece, I find the culture of Central and Latin America um, to be much closer to the Mediterranean lifestyle of Southern Italy, Southern Spain, and Greece. Um, the food, the drink, the family, the outdoor life, uh, the culture, the passion, the music, all of that is very, very similar to me. Um, so I always feel very much at home when I visit um, uh, Spanish-speaking South America, yeah. 
Yes, it feels the same. I studied in Italy and it feels the same. I visited mm -hmm. Greece and the same. Andreas, I'm really, really, really happy to have, have you here and this conversation. And we'll see you soon, probably in Venezuela, and you'll see that we have a better future for sure. Yes, thank you so much. Bye-bye, thanks.